write books about what's going on in the Muslim world because I have an expertise in what's going on in the Muslim world. I actually travel through the Muslim world. I study the Muslim world. I understand the conversations that are taking place. And so I, I feel like, in a sense, <clears throat> I'm in a better position to sort of make judgments about what's, what sort of socio or religious or political developments are, are taking place within this people of, you know, one and a half billion uh, a, a number. Um, statements like there are millions of Muslims who, you know, have this sort of death cult are profoundly inaccurate mm. and are based on nothing except your sort of general impression of a region and of a religion that you have a very surface understanding of. Well, it's not, for instance, in the end of faith, I cite these Pew polls that were done in nine Muslim countries, actually not the most radicalized, I and mean, the most radicalized countries wouldn't let the polling be done, but even in, <clears throat> even in Turkey, uh, the, you know, the Muslim success story on many fronts, the level of support for suicide bombing against non-combatants in defense of the faith was shocking. I mean, you, get, you just run the numbers. When 77% when of people in Lebanon say that it is justified, that's, you know, it's not a minority. It's not even close to a minority. In, even if it were only 5% of the Muslim world that was radicalized by my lights, that is still a problem we have to talk about soberly. I mean, this is that we're still we're talking about seventy-five million people. Certainly, and I don't think anybody would would say that you know that's not a conversation that we need to talk about. But but, but it's, but but it's a civilizational problem that now, that, that, that is what, not amenable to simply I don't know saying what, that that Islam is a religion of peace. I don't understand what what Islamic civilization means. I mean, I don't. No, I'm, I'm not what, talking. What I'm talking is, about our this global civilization. Oh, I see. Um, the I, I think look the the, the you have to keep putting pressure on on uh, bad ideas because that's that's the thing about bad ideas they they don't they don't respond well to pressure they don't they're, they're people who have internal contradictions uh, in their lives that they uh, can notice uh, because they're you know do you do you think prayer works many people say yes absolutely I think prayer works and, I, and then you say okay well you know we have a new airline where the, the pilots are just going to rely on prayer to land the planes uh, ticket, tickets will be cheap, and you know you can Very you know, you sign up. You know, um, who's going to sign up for that airline? If you, if you, if if the pilot comes over the PA system and tells you that he's convinced that prayer is all he needs to land this plane, you know you, you're just going to see just stark terror on the faces of even the most religious people. Uh, and so that's a that's a contradiction that can be pointed out. Uh, and there, are, uh, we have to do that a thousand fold, uh, and just keep doing it. But as you say, you know, global warming, evolution, these are, these are, the jury's not out on questions and many people just don't subscribe and that's just, it's a failure of conversation ultimately. The ancient philosopher um, Blaise Pascal wrote in his Pensees, hmm. the heart has reason in which reason does not know. We know this in countless ways. What would you say to people who try to lead a good and just life by, um, through their religion and by following what is in their hearts rather than following the literal sayings of the Bible and following reasoning. Yeah, well, I certainly don't mean to diminish experience that, that has nothing to do with coming to a rational understanding of the way the world works. I mean, it's, much of our experience is not a matter of reason. It's not a matter of, of belief even. And, I, and, and some of the most important aspects of our experience aren't. So experiencing love and devotion and awe. I mean, these, these are, are features of our subjectivity that I think are extraordinarily valuable. The important thing to recognize is that if you think the only real container, the only viable container for those experiences is your denominational church, is, your, is, is, the, is the, the language of your ancestors, you know, if, you're, if you're still committed to being a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, I think you are tacitly... Um, supporting the religious divisions in our world. I mean, you are, you are giving cover, I think, quite explicitly to all of the people who take their holy books far more seriously. I mean, I can't tell you how much time I, I and other people have spent having to fight the battle against the liberals and moderate Christians and Jews and Muslims 
who will, who will insist upon the viability of, of these denominations and of raising their children to, to, be, to think that they're Christians and Muslims and Jews, and will, who will never admit that any of the, the extremist behavior going on in the name of their faith has anything to do with religion. And so it, 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 there's no question in my mind that it provides a kind of friction uh, in, our, in our discourse where we really can't call a spade a spade and say, okay, this is much, much of the Bible and the Quran is just life-destroying gibberish and we just have to acknowledge this and, and cease to take these books seriously. It's perfectly clear to me that my style of conversation is not what can be broadcast to the Muslim world to change people's minds. I mean, that is your job. You are much better suited for that job. And I would agree with you that in order to empower the moderates of the Muslim world, drawing cartoons of the prophet and, and writing paragraphs of the sort I've written is not a strategy. Um, I'm not a diplomat. And uh, I don't know, but what's troubling me is I don't know where the line is between encouraging moderation, representing what Islam could be. You know, Islam could be a religion of peace, perhaps. Jihad could be just an inner spiritual struggle and have nothing to do with holy war. Uh, indeed, that we have to raise a generation of Muslims who believe uh, those things. Uh, but pretending that it is already is problematic because it isn't for so many millions of Muslims. And uh, it may be that, that if you pretend hard enough, in fact, you become what you pretend to be. And maybe that's, maybe that's part of the process. But uh, I think we have to admit to ourselves that we are confronting the behavior of a death cult among millions and millions of Muslims, not 10,000 who went to training camps in Afghanistan. Um, we, are, we are confronting an endorsement of this kind of behavior and a, a reflexive political solidarity where Muslims side with other Muslims, no matter how sociopathic their behavior, simply because there are other Muslims. Uh, we can't deny the problem while trying to encourage a more benign face of the religion. I think that the issue of belief is that um, I, don't, I don't see religious belief as distinct from any other kinds of beliefs. I mean, we, we represent the world in our thoughts. And all of us are in the business of hoping that our, that our represent, representations are accurate, or at least accurate enough so that we can successfully negotiate our lives happily. I mean, nobody wants to be mistaken, profoundly mistaken, about their place in the world, or about what, you know, what happens after death, or... Uh, where, their, where their loved ones go. I mean, we're, we're not in the business of deceiving ourselves just willfully. Um, and so religious beliefs are on all fours with all of our other beliefs. We are describing the world. We're trading in, the, in these descriptions through language. Someone says to you, well, do you realize that Jesus is your personal savior and, and you know, nobody, you know, he's the way and the truth and the life and nobody gets to heaven but through him. That is a, that is a, a description of the way this universe is organized in moral terms and in, in spiritual terms, and it's either right or wrong, and it purports to be right, uh, and it, it, it offers, it promises terrible consequences who though, to, the, to those who don't accept it. Um, now, this is a very strange scheme, I think, to believe in. I, mean, I don't, I'm not the first person to, to point out that it's a very strange sort of loving God who would, who would have salvation depend on a person's ability to believe in him for bad reasons. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it just, it's, a, it's a weird scenario, but it's a scenario that is, is many people find emotionally consoling. And, and this, another aspect here is that reason and belief are, are not easily separated from emotion. I mean, we, our, emotion, our, our rational lives are deeply entangled with our emotional lives, and we feel emotional responses to things we find to be unreasonable. I mean, I, you know, I happen to think that, that doubt is, a, is on the continuum with disgust and other psychological rejection states. And so when we doubt a proposition, we are having an emotional response to it. And so I, I, th I think we, um, you know, we, we just have to be, I think there's, a, there's an all-purpose corrective here, which is just intellectual honesty. I mean, if you cease to pretend to be certain about things you're not certain about, see where that gets you. See where that gets you in conversation with other human beings. I think it'll get you a profoundly ethical life. It'll, it'll certainly get you a profoundly non-deceptive life. Uh, Which leads me to one other quick follow-up question. Yeah. When you say um, 
being intellectually honest and admitting you don't know these things. Mm -hmm. You said there were three ways to look at religion. One, that it's true. Second, that it's useful. useful yeah. And third, that you're an atheist and that is a religion. But there's a fourth thing, and that could be that you're an agnostic. You don't know whether it's true yeah, or not. Yeah, but I, I don't meet too many agnostics about Zeus. <laughs> yeah. you know, all these agnostics about the God of Abraham should also be agnostic about Zeus. I mean, that's okay. the same scenario. If the poorest, most molested people were, by and large, the jihadists and the engineers and the architects and the doctors, people who had a benefit of, of uh, the good life, were disproportionately moderate, then this analysis of yours would make some sense. But we have someone like uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, right? A surgeon. He comes from one of the most respected families in Egypt. He's got doctors and judges and pharmacists, as far as the eye can see. Um, he is not an exception. He is not, if you correct for literacy in the Muslim world, support for suicide bombing goes up. I mean, this is that the most radicalized people uh, are not the people who, in particular, well, you can see this in microcosm when you actually look at the biographies of the 19 hijackers. These were all college educated. Many of them had PhDs. I mean, it's just not the religion really is separable uh, as the most important va variable. And what is actually right on the surface to be seen is that these people are telling us what is motivating them. The jihadis are talking all day long about the pleasures that await martyrs in paradise, the, 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 just the, the horrors of living in proximity with the infidels, the, the desecration of the Muslim holy sites by the proximity of, of uh, uh, infidel troops on the ground. I mean, this is, you know, Osama bin Laden tells us what motivates him. He's telling us why he's not living in Paris and dating models with his inheritance. I mean, he's, he, he is being quite articulate ad nauseum. Um, and so to deny the role that religion is playing, I would never for a moment say that, that there are not poor, mistreated people driven to extremis uh, and to extreme violence for reasons other than religion. Of course that happens. But this is a, a, this is a separable component which we have rendered by the terms of our discourse by our emotional attachment to it, immune to criticism. It is taboo to say that the Quran is bogus as a, as a document that, that describes the history of, of uh, uh, the evolution of our species, as a document that makes really cogent prescriptions about how to live in the, in the 21st century, as is the Bible. Uh, almost entirely bogus if you're going to take it as a, as a text to live by. Um, it is taboo to say that. You could not possibly get elected in this country if you even openly doubted whether or not there was a creator God listening to, to the prayers of your constituents. I mean, this is the world we are living in, and it's... Uh, well, I, Sam, I, 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 I just I have to say... Atheism is really a term we do not need. I mean, it, in the same way that we don't have a word for someone who's not an astrologer. You know, no, <laughs> you know we don't have websites for non-astrologers. There are no groups for non-astrologers. Nobody wakes up in the morning feeling the need to remind himself that he's not an astrologer. The irony is that atheism is completely without content. It is not a philosophical position. And all religious people are atheists with respect to everyone else's religion. I mean, we're all atheists with respect to the thousands of dead gods who lie in that mass grave we call mythology. I mean, think of Thor and Isis and Zeus. You know, they, they, these were once gods in good standing among our ancestors. But the, more importantly, every Christian rejects the claims of Islam, just as I do. You know, Muslims claim that they have the perfect word of the creator of the universe. Why do they believe this? Because it says so in the book. Sorry, not good enough. So, so th this term atheism really is misleading. We're talking about specific truth claims and their evidence, or lack thereof. The atheist is simply saying, as Carl Sagan did, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If ever there were an antidote to dogmatism, this is it.